How y'all doing today? Uh, my name is Trevor Grant, and I will be giving this talk. This is the talk about the better mousetraps uh, and marketing on open source projects. Um, a little about me. I'm a PMC of Apache Mahout and Apache Streams. I'm an open source evangelist at IBM, and I am, uh, I've got my Master's of Applied Mathematics, an MBA, um, and a website, and a Twitter handle, and I'm also uh, available at apache.org, so please reach out. Um, a little bit about Mahout. So the way the flow of this project is, we're going to, this is maybe a case study of um, going through this marketing, and Mahout's had some really interesting and different problems than a lot of projects have. Um, in the case of Mahout, we've got a really high brand recognition. Unfortunately, that brand recognition is for something that we don't do anymore. Um, so this is, we're recognized for the wrong things. When people do a search for Mahout, they're finding blog posts for what we used to do. Um, originally, it was a Lucene sub-project. It became a top-level project in 2010. It was machine learning for MapReduce uh, and Hadoop. That was the, the famous Mahout that everyone hears about. Um, then there was the rise of Spark ML, MLlib, and the old um, graphs on how much faster machine learning runs on Spark were implicitly running against um, Mahout. Now, am I advancing? No? There we go. Um, there's three kind of open source projects in general. You either on your open source project, either no one knows about your project and you wish they would find out about it. Um, everyone misunderstands your project. They've heard of it, but they don't really understand what it does. Or everyone knows your project and they want to be a committer on it and a contributor. And if that's the real big problem you're having, Holden's giving a talk right next door on exactly that. Um, but for the first two people, here we are. Um, <clears throat> now, I said... Um, I used to, uh, no, I didn't mention on my about me. My first job, I was a data scientist at a media strategy firm. It's called a company called Mindshare, part of WPP, um, which is a really big media company. Now, I'm assuming that everyone in this audience is a developer, not an ad man, just because that's what conference we're at. Um, but marketing's for everyone. You started working on your open source project because you wanted to write some code about something you really cared about. And the problem is you want people to use your project. And the problem there is people need to find out about it. And the marketing teams aren't doing open source. They have their own philanthropic pursuits that they follow. So you're the marketing team. You signed up to write some free code, but someone's got to market it and it's going to have to be you or people on your project. The exception is, or there's two. Either you don't market and nobody uses your project and you're okay with that because you really, really just wanted to write the software. Or the second exception is you start a company with your project, you get some VC money, you pay a marketing team, and that works too. And I have no problem with people taking advantage of the VC vampires. If you want to do that, go nuts. But <clears throat> assuming you're going to be doing your own marketing, I'm going to present something called a marketing funnel. This is a pretty standard business 101 idea that applies to any project or product, um, open source software included. You have an awareness, a bunch of awareness. People are aware of your product first. Then they become, they consider using your project. Then they maybe use it once or they try it out. Then they become a regular user. And then they become like a product champion, someone who really cares about your product. Uh, as an example of this, would you please raise your hand if you've heard of Apache Mahout before today? Okay, everyone raise your hand then, because you heard of Apache Mahout now. So everybody start. Keep your hands up then if you have ever considered using Apache Mahout. Keep your hands up if you've ever downloaded and tried Mahout once. Okay, we're getting a little weaker. And keep them up if you were a regular user, you built anything around Mahout. So at this point, the funnel has now gone to zero, unfortunately. Um, but that's the idea. And any open source project is really going to follow that. And then past user, a person who regularly uses the product, you have a contributor. And 
So we want to get more contributors usually, or maybe we're just trying to get users, but we need to set those goals. And so this story is going to be about the challenges Mahout's had in going through this funnel and rebuilding things because we do not do MapReduce anymore. Um, and when I introduce myself and I, they, you know, I'll be in an interview or people ask, oh, do you have any experience doing, you know, machine learning with big data? And I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm a PMC on Apache Mahout. And they're like, oh, best case, they will say, I've never heard of Apache Mahout. And I'm like, great, we start from ground zero and I can start telling you about it. But normally what I get is, um, do people still do learning on MapReduce? I don't use MapReduce anymore. Did you know machine learning is a lot faster on Spark than on MapReduce? And isn't Mahout dead, which is always my favorite. Um, we don't do, yeah, we, we run on Spark now. We run on Spark, we run on lots of engines. So we always end up having to have that conversation. Um, it's, so instead of just telling them what the project does, we have to dismantle all these old ideas. It is what it is. Um, so we're trying to evangelize and rebrand. Um, and this is about opening up that top level, that awareness. We, want to we need to make people aware not only of Mahout, which a lot of people already are, but we need to make them aware that we've changed what we're doing. Um, we did a really, really big push on this fall of 2016, spring 2017. It sort of petered out, and we'll talk about that slightly along the way. But... Um, yeah, a lot of conference talks, a lot of evangelism. In developer circles, blog posts and conference talks are how people hear about things. Um, I feel like I'm literally preaching to the choir here because you're all at a conference learning about new things. And Berlin Buzzwords was right before. Um, we, did, we petered out as we went to the fall and spring of 2018. Still hit a couple and then blog posts. Again, pushing those out via Twitter, but just trying to make people aware that our product is still around, it's not dead, and it's changed. Um, <clears throat> so we were, and we started gaining traction. This was a really exciting part. You know, we start off, I was hearing a lot more Isn't Mahout Dead in 2016 and early 2017 than I have recently, which is nice. I'm usually either getting, I've never heard of it, or they have heard of it and they know what it is, and that's great. Um, PMCs and people on the project can always write blog posts, and we obviously care a lot about it, so we'll write. Getting out new users to come in and contribute and write blog posts feels a lot better because that means someone's using the product. Everyone wants to feel like your product's being used. These people are not only using it, but they're using it enough that they care to write a blog post. So when I, I gave a very similar talk to this at ApacheCon in Miami last year, and there was about 10 blog posts that had come out in the last six months that were about Mahoop for Matt Reproduce. I'm like, well, great. Um, I was updating the slides. I could only find one in the last year. So that's good. That's progress. We're moving in the right direction. Um, also, the I'd like to call out the oh top skills data scientists need to learn. In 2018, Apache Mahoop was number two. And it was by, this was according to the guy who wrote Neo4j, which is a big graph database. So... I don't know if he was talking about the new Mahout. I'm going to assume he was. It wasn't explicitly stated. Um, and so that felt really nice. A very non-scientific, non-data-based graph that you can use is the purple line is the amount of effort of people working on the project over the last, uh, well, year and a half, two years. And the effect of all that work is the blue line. There's a lag. Um, this is also can be demoralizing when you're working and working and working and maybe putting like 20 hours of your free time in on this project and it just doesn't feel like anything's starting to stick. Then, you know, maybe you take a little breather and you come back and look at it a few months later and like, oh yeah, there's blog posts. People are starting to use it. All that work I did is starting to pay off and you get maybe that um, revitalization. You get excited about it again. So... <clears throat> That uh, the, the, the major points, there was a Zeppelin integration. I'm not sure if we have a lot of math or necessarily Apache people. It was a cool thing. We'll breeze by it in a little bit. Um, we did a big release in 2017. Now, well, we'll talk about that too. There was a little, there's a little asterisk on that one. We came up with a new website, um, but for a couple reasons, we died off on our efforts. Um, 
But like I said, when I was looking at this and just starting to do my research to kind of update these slides, I realized, hey, we've had some really good um, bounce back. Now, another way to do that maybe instead of like looking at it once a year is using analytics. And this is kind of going back to business nerd stuff, but you want to do analytics on your project so you can you know, kind of take the pulse of how popular things are. Are people using it? Um, Apache has an internal tool that lets you see the number of downloads off the official mirror. Um, this is Google Analytics on the left that gives you lots of interesting analytics about your website. Um, Twitter Analytics. So all these tools that you should be using to pump up your project in the first place usually have some sort of free analytics package to them. And the key is just use it. Just use it and look at it every once a week or once a month or anytime you're feeling bad like no one uses your project. And you can be like, no, we have about 500 users a day, at, well, on weekdays. We go drop down to maybe 250 on the weekends um, that you know, we can see how are people getting to our site, organic search from social media channels. It's a fun way to kill some time when you feel like doing some project stuff but you don't necessarily want to code. Um, arguably, we could write all this ourselves because we're a machine learning project, but the Google version is so nice and easy and pretty charts. So it is what it is. Um, so the evangelism. Evangelism was our solution to increasing the awareness. We want more people to know about Mahout because, as we were talking about earlier, no one's going to download the project if they've never heard of it. That's, um, or no one's going to consider using it if they never heard of it. You need to, the first step in broadening out this marketing funnel is making people aware of your project. <clears throat> now, the next step was, so people have heard of Mahout. This was something that was killing us all through the big evangelism push of the 20, early 2017, was that we were getting people excited about our project, and they were going and seeing our old website, built in 2014, right before we shifted away from MapReduce. You can see at the top bar that two of the three like drop-down menus are about MapReduce. So now that people have just heard this big talk about Mahout isn't about MapReduce anymore, and they Google it on their phones, and they're like, it looks like it's still about MapReduce, though, just, just, by, just looking at the website. Um, it is what it is. Uh, there's also Wikipedia pages that like, need to be updated. So getting a new website was a really big push for us. Um, we were originally, uh, we were running on the old Apache content management system. Um, a problem with that is only committers can update the website. We had people doing drive-bys all the time like, hey, I noticed a link is out of date. Here's the correct link. I noticed a typo on this page. Website fixes because, you know, people, you know, maybe they're interested in the project and maybe they just want to do a little help, but um, website fixes are great newbie issues. If, you know, a lot of people don't have experience doing pull requests to an open source project and they don't feel like they're smart enough experts to maybe critique your stochastic singular value decomposition algorithm, but that's definitely a typo and they're very sure that it's a typo and they can make a little PR and a bug and a pull request. Um, and it's a great way to bring people in. We've got, I think, three PRs sitting out right now that are just that. And that's, yeah, it's a great way to get people interacting with the community, make them feel like they're part. Um, so that was one of the main reasons we decided to do that. The other was when people contribute new algorithms, we wanted documentation to be a requirement of the contribution. You can't just drive by and drop off some cool new math algorithm with no explanation of what it does, how it does, why it does it. Um, and when the website is in with the code, the same pull request must have a updated you know, a documentation page. Or if you added a feature to an algorithm, it updates the documentation along with it. Um, so the new image websites, easy to make, mm, but very tough to design, especially for a bunch of math and distributed engineering nerds. Um, we had seen a couple other sites that were using Jekyll Bootstrap. We decided we wanted to use Jekyll Bootstrap too. Um, but there was a couple like really bad implementations. We finally had, uh, we got a hold of a guy named David Miller, startbootstrap.com. Um, he does Jekyll websites for a living. We're like, we need help. We can maintain this thing. You don't have to do any work. We just need like a basic design pattern. He makes themes and skins and things. Um, and so he did, he helped us out and made this really, really beautiful theme. If you go online, the, the lines at the bottom, they wave. So that's always, I don't know, it's it. 
I, I thought it was fun. Um, it's got like a news section. It's got tweets. It's, it's a very, very nice site now. One that doesn't say MapReduce all over it. So we have a little bit more credence when we say Mahout's not about MapReduce. Um, yeah. So the other thing, you will notice that there's this new logo down in the right cor hand corner of all these slides. Um, we had a bike shed argument about redesigning an old logo. We knew that we, everyone agreed, everyone in the community agreed, we needed a new logo. Um, the old a Mahout is someone who drives an elephant, it's a Sanskrit word, and since it, the project was machine learning on MapReduce, and MapReduce has the Hadoop elephant. It made sense to have like the Mahout driving the elephant, but this was very counterintuitive to our story about we're not about MapReduce anymore. So <clears throat> we had a big argument, and everyone had their two cents on what they thought the logo should be. Um, and the designer, and so this is another little trick on how you can sometimes just flank it, and so if everybody agrees it needs to change, the designer's like, look, man, I need something that... The yellow and blue don't go with the color scheme. I need some new logo. I don't care what. I just need something to make this work with the website. And we're like, we had a big fight about it. It took like three months and nobody decided anything. We like submitted requests. We had a 99 designs campaign. And we couldn't, we, we are unable to make a decision on a new campaign. All we know is we need a new one. Just make something up. And he's like, okay. So he made that up. That was a placeholder out, uh, logo. Uh, so if you've been up to the Apache Lounge, you'll see that all the logos are on the banner. Now that's an older banner, and it still has the old Mahout logo, but I was at Go to Chicago a couple of months ago, and there's a new banner. It was a brand new banner that I'd been shipped to set up at the thing, and somehow, and I'm not really sure how, but the new logo got picked up and was put on the banner. So apparently that's our new logo, and that's how these things, things work sometimes. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, thank you, David Miller, for the logo on the website. The, okay, so now people have heard of our project and they've Googled it. Great, we got them to the website. Now we want to have a useful product. Um, I'm not going to make this a whole talk about Mahout, but I will say we've got some killer new features that we've released recently. Uh, GPU integration. If you follow anything about machine learning AI, everyone wants GPU integration. So we have that. An algorithm framework. Zeppelin. Um, we'll go through these. These increase, the fact you have good features increases the consideration. You have the features people want in a piece of software. Now they've, they're aware of the software. They've checked it out. The features that they want exist in the software. Great. Now getting people to download the software. Um, Zeppelin's kind of like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and we came up with an integration. And there was an issue with the integration. Just a little tiny one. Um, there was a version mismatch between the Spark version that Zeppelin shipped and what Mahout had pre-compiled. Now, we did that release of 13.0 last year. And we're like, all right, cool. But we need to bump that up to a newer version of Spark, a newer version of Scala. We'll just do that real quick, two weeks. We'll turn around, we did a release, we're going to do another release two weeks later with just a quick version bump. So that's what we thought was going to happen. Um, in reality, there were some issues. Uh, one of our dependencies was version locked. Um, so that was fun. And that caused build issues in SBT, which is the Scala build tool, if you're familiar with that, which eventually led to... Um, a lot of fighting and name calling on Slack and the mailing lists. Um, being in an open source project is like being in a family. You fight whenever you have time. Um, so, and, oh, and George Demet is giving a talk on this next door. So if you want to hear more about settling those projects uh, or problems, I'll be in there. But we, everyone blamed everyone else. It was a, it was a thing. Finally, um, about two weeks ago, we decided, we didn't need to do some palm cleaning. Um, there was a lot of old MapReduce stuff. It was an entire project that totally pivoted its direction. When it did so, it was done quick. The MapReduce stuff was still kind of supported, but not really. Um, I've been a PMC, I think, for a year and a half and a committer for a little over two years, maybe right around two years. Um, there were like half the project was old dark magic that no one currently on the project, no one goes in there. That's, that's, that's old magic, and we don't, we don't know what it does. We don't want to break it, so we don't touch it. And I'm like, okay. Well, started going through and trying to clean these things. Um, the trick was Java programmers. Anyone? Anyone? No? No Java, really? Okay, well, 
Java has something called POMs, and we deleted all the POMs, and like they have, they were these massive like you know 2,500 line documents of just dependencies and this is and that's and build tools and plugins and whatever. Delete them, or name them dot backup, and start rebuilding a POM file from scratch. Start merging modules back together and cleaning out like all this old junk. Um, because sometimes code is like an appendix and it had a really useful function at one point, but it's been so long ago, nobody remembers what it is. Um, and so we did a lot of appendectomies. Um, there were three logging frameworks and four unit testing frameworks in the project. So now I didn't get rid of them all, but we have very clear JIRA issues like get, cut this down to one, we, we only need one testing framework. We don't need all, like in the same module, they'll have like three of them because someone wrote one function and then someone wrote another function, didn't understand the other testing framework. Like, I'll just use this one I know. Great. Um, so getting all that wrapped around, okay, we finally got it. Um, the point being is before they can download, you need to have the features, you need to have a project that people can understand. Um, this is another feature, but it's a more important one. If we think of all the people in the world who understand distributed engines, like Spark and Flink and just distributed engines in general, that's a, that's a small set. Now, if you think of the people in the world who understand advanced mathematics and like stochastic or, you know, singular value decompositions and k-means and like how to actually write these algorithms, this is also a small set. And if we get the overlap between the two groups, this is a very small set. So. Scala has this thing where you can write um, a domain-specific language. And one of the early things Mahout had done was make a mathematically expressive domain-specific language. And a way to think of that is like, it's like R. You can write these um, lines that look like math. They lo it looks more mathy than like your regular Java, you know, A dot transpose and then the name of the next whatever you're trying to do. Um, this looks like R, which mathematicians use quite a lot. It also looks like MATLAB, kind of. Um, so this was good, though, because if we want more people to contribute algorithms, we now have opened that up to, a, there are a lot more people who are qualified because they don't need to be Scala experts or Java experts. You just need to more or less know your way around R, and we can kind of help you out. Um, also, possibly putting um, TensorFlow on the back end. Yeah, because everyone loves TensorFlow. Um, actually, so TensorFlow is a great example of this. TensorFlow, if you've used it, uh, I hate Google's Python. Um, Python's supposed to be a very expressive language you can just read. They somehow make it like very ugly and not type safe Java. It, they destroy everything that was nice about Python um, and then they, that's, and that's what they ship. So at least you can write mathematically expressive TensorFlow if we get these bindings set up. Okay, now we've worked our way down the funnel a little bit. Um, people can download things. Um, oh, and we've, we've increased our user base and our contributor base a little bit. Now, the engine neutrality, um, because the whole idea is we can have different back-end engines. Um, this also... Jokes. Um, ah, this is important because there are some big companies that will not declare that they're using Mahout, but they are, and this engine neutrality is a big deal for them. Um, because if you are proprietary company X and you want everyone to use, you know, your special high speed database, which is probably just a wrapper around another open source database, but you've made an appliance out of it. So it's whatever. Um, but you don't want to write an entirely new machine learning framework from the ground up. You can just take Mahout and shimmy shimmy and write some bindings and da da, you're done. Um, but that also increases our users. The algorithm framework we talked about, um, it also makes this easy to, for people who are doing a pull review. Um, when you're doing, you're maintaining a machine learning project, you not only have to have people who understand the, the code and like what Scala is doing, but also that like the mathematics that are being laid down are doing the right thing, that this person has correctly defined this function in this language. When you have a mathematically expressive DSL, that also makes it easy to like not only contribute, but to, or if that person just decides they're gonna take off, they don't care anymore about the project, it's whatever, people who come by later can still read those algorithms and know what you're saying. Um, we made a template to make it easier for people to drag and drop algorithms into our framework. Um, encouraging everyone to use dev, the dev lists. This is a, an Apache specific thing. Um, sh surprisingly hard sometimes for people to like 
figure out how to use a mailing list. They're, you just send an email and subscribe and whatever, but the guy who was um, helping us out with the website, I think it took a while to get him actually on the mailing list. Um, but, or he was being quiet. It could have been either way. Um, but you know, doing that hand-holding with people who are new committers um, is another important thing and contributors. And so this is the, our marketing funnel, but now much, much, much bigger because of all the steps we've been taking. Um, now, how this actually progressed, I think we did the math DSL first, and then we had that big spike in 2016 to 2017. You don't have to necessarily do it first aware. You ideally should do it, well, not even necessarily, because if you make a bunch of people aware of your thing, but then your product's not ready, all you're doing is setting up trouble for yourself later on down the road because they think your product doesn't work. Um, but the things to think about when you're trying to market your open source project then are awareness, consideration, casual user, user, and then like a uh, product you know, champion or an evangelist or contributor. Um, so what's next? We're working on our algorithms framework. We're working on our GPUs. There's a big number of things. Um, more engine bindings, getting over the version lock. That is just about done. Um, we're also talking about maybe accepting Mahout, uh, MapReduce PRs again. That was a, it's, we're talking about it. It was a thing that um, we stopped when we deprecated the MapReduce. We want people to be like, no, we're not doing MapReduce anymore. But it's been three years. People are now starting to write blog posts and understand we don't do that. And there are still some MapReduce users and there are, there's a couple bugs, there's a couple old PRs, they didn't get their PR done in time for whatever the cutoff date. And if people want to do that, that's fine. We don't necessarily, we're not MapReduce experts, but if we can find someone who can review it and say, yeah, this looks pretty legit, then that's uh, an idea we're opening back up. Um, the conclusion then is, cause I'm doing, yeah, we're doing okay on time. Um, we did a big transportation. Um, and we want people to, be aware that we did this big transformation. Um, but I guess for the point of this crowd, it's that even if you have, everybody knows about your project, but they know about it for the wrong thing, that's fine. It doesn't mean like all is lost or you have to scrap the project. Arguably, maybe we should have scrapped it and made a new project, but we didn't. Um, and I think that's okay now. We still have, you, you can ride that old brand recognition out and you can do something good with it. Um, Memes always help talks. You should always use memes in your talks uh, and try to get people to giggle. Um, and remember that, and remember the marketing funnel. If there's, if there's any real content here, it's basically this one slide and that all of your, you maybe don't have to focus on it exclusively, but if you want people to use your project, you need then to think of, you know, what are you doing and how are you, where, where, are, the, where are the roadblocks? Where is that funnel? This isn't really drawn to scale, you would ideally want people to be become aware, consider it, use it, you know, and like you want that angle to be pretty, pretty sharp. Yeah, sharp. Um, so thinking about how many people, just thinking about this sort of thing, use it as a framework when you're considering what's going on with your project, where are your bottlenecks, um, how are you going to reach more users? Um, yep. So with that, I am going to open up the floor for questions. Are you like the sort of lone voice for marketing in your project or is your community generally sort of quite aware of this is something we need to be doing? <clears throat> um, I would say, so the question, or I guess you had the mic. So um, I would say that Everyone was aware that we needed to do more marketing. Um, it's, a, it's a community of volunteers. We have various amounts of time and you know every business is cyclical. I had a strong background working in media agencies, which for data science or math people, like it was, it was somewhat different. Um, so I was able to see like, yeah, we need to be talking about this. We need to do this. Um, there have been there's usually always a couple people who are really, really good speakers who like to go out and give the talks. Um, and there, and there still are, um, I think Musselman, Andrew Musselman's another guy on the project who's really been doing even more this year than I have. Um, and we also have this kind of concept of a duocracy where, you know, it was like the logo. 
everyone knew that the logo, the old logo was bad. It was a bad logo. We needed to do something else. But no one was able to do anything. And that's why, again, and especially in the case of the logo, it was great to have just, like, let's just tap an outsider and randomly delegate the power to make something. And then if no one complains, okay, that, that works then. Let's, it could, because it was, and you shouldn't necessarily do that on all your projects and all your problems, but sometimes the logo doesn't matter. The logo has nothing to do with the effectiveness of the product. And we were, except that the old logo was bad. Um, so I guess, yeah, the community realizes that there's a problem. Um, some people will be better than others at uh, helping out and jumping on board with that. Oh, I can do this one. The question is, do you get a lot of bike shed arguments? Yeah, nope. Totally. Um, so the initial website refactor, um, the question is, do we get a lot of bike shed arguments? Visual, you know, if you ask everyone for their opinion and input, everyone will give it to you. Um, we, but again, with the duocracy, the duocracy, especially in our community, kind of carries the day. Um, go for it and some, open the PR and see if anybody gripes. And normally, if they don't, then cool. Um, we also, but sometimes they will. And when they do gripe, you should take it seriously. Don't try to bull your things through. Um, I did a first pass on the website and it was hideous, um, but it was something. And because one someone on the project was on the, con it wasn't like really felt moved over to the Jekyll and like the internal code. And I had like the new website and staging so people could look at it. And he accidentally committed something and no one's really sure how, but the new version of the site got launched and it was luckily at like three in the morning, but he's on the Slack like, oh my God, what do I do? And I'm like, oh, I think I can. And I had, just in case we wanted to roll back to the old site one day for like retro day, I had kept a skin of the old site. I'm like, okay, we can save this. Don't worry. Um, got off traffic there. In general, no. People are really, as long as you, if you're willing to do the work, and if somebody doesn't like it, then they should be willing to step up and do the work too. Um, you can't just be a negative Nancy. Um, I would say is more of a community standard than an official rule, but it's a good one. So there, there are a lot of talks about um, how to do better marketing for developers. So there are a couple things that are a lot of other people are covering, which is mm -hmm. um, how to actually, you know, write something that's that's useful and approachable. And then also how to plan, which you're, you were talking about a bit, mm -hmm. is how like you organize your project, because I'm not going to do it all, but I can do one blog post and maybe you can do something else. Yep. But the thing that I thought was was new here was the reminder of your, your graph of effort versus effect, mm -hmm. right? Because marketing is, uh, takes time. Yep. Right, you get your message out, you've done something useful, it takes time for that to circulate for somebody else to echo it, which yep. is not like what developers have. I mean, yes, we complain that CI takes three hours to finish the build, <laughs> but yep. your awareness thing is going to take months to mm -hmm. really show value. Yep. So be patient is a key message, I think, for developers. Yeah, I, I think that's 100% right. And you're, you're spot on with that. As developers, we make a little change in the code and we want to see the results now. Don't have that kind of the faith of the ad men to be like, well, we'll just do brand recognition advertising and, and eventually people will come to know the brand. Um, yeah, I would agree very wholeheartedly. Other questions? Okay, well, I assume it's just because I did give a really, really amazing talk and covered all the basis points, so. Uh, thank you all for coming out and feel free to stop by and um, either tweet at me or ask me after this or whatever you'd like to do and I'll be around till tomorrow. So thanks. <laughs>